دكتور شو شو
Monash Community Legal Centre put together and they made the point that there is no universal language. There are different languages and even different dialects in tribes and regions. And Subi went through quite a lot of that in his talk yesterday explaining the um, incredible history that Sudan has had. I know that there are religious differences. Um, some people are uh, Muslim, some people are Christian, some people choose not to have any religion. Um, so there's, there's no unity or, or single identity from that point of view. Um, I don't really understand the political positions that the Muslims come from, but I do know that there are different political views. And of course, that's why there are wars as well. And I do know that there are different levels of education dealt with people whose education has been completely undermined by their refugee experience and people who have incredible um, knowledge and um, qualifications. So we're dealing with, with a huge diversity of people and a huge diversity of needs. But I guess what I'm wanting everybody to focus on today is what brings everybody together and what allows us to think of uh, the Sudanese in Australia as one group. And the predominant thing that seems to be is that people talk about Sudan and identify as Sudanese rather than Dinka or Nora or... I mean, those things are important, but, but first and foremost I hear people say that they come from Sudan and that they are Sudanese. The vast majority of people in Australia, Sudanese people in Australia, share the refugee experience and the trauma and difficulties that arise out of that process. The overwhelming thing from the number of people that I deal with is that they are motivated to help others. The people that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis in the Sudanese community work passionately for other people in their community. And one of the most inspiring things of working with the Sudanese community is that there is this hope for a better future. I have actually worked with lots of people in um, positions of disadvantage and, um, and I thought that the, the war experience, the refugee experience, the language difficulties for Sudanese people would have to be one of the most difficult things to deal with. And then I went and worked in Melton with people who were born in Australia who are third and fourth generation unemployed and poor and poorly educated. And those people are so difficult to work with because they just don't have hope anymore. And I came back to Footscray and worked with the African community and see that no matter how hard it gets, how difficult it can be, and how awful things seem, that the Sudanese continue to have hope that this will get better and that we can make a better future for our children. So what I'm really wanting to talk to everybody about today is representation and how we can uh, represent the needs of the Sudanese people in Australia. Now, collective organisations is a way of organising so that we can achieve more. More of us coming together we can achieve more. And that can be informal through social networks. We just get together and drink coffee or smoke cigarettes and talk about something and decide on something happening. It can be more formal. We can work through our churches or temples or we can form associations. The big question though is who speaks for the Sudanese in Australia? There has been negative publicity in the past few years and of course um, this has been the experience of many new settling uh, groups in Australia. Many years ago the Vietnamese were targeted as um, having gangs and, um, uh, and being a, a disruptive element and not understanding the Australian way and all this kind of stuff. Before that the Greeks and Italians were seen as dangerous and threatening to the way of life and all of that kind of stuff. And when these things happen, we do want to speak out and say, just because one person in the community 
has done something does not mean that the Sudanese and Australia are a bad influence. Or just because one, uh, one person expresses a particular view does not speak for the whole of the Sudanese in Australia. But the question is, who will speak for the Sudanese in Australia? And more importantly, what issues do Australian Sudanese want or need to speak out on? What do you want to stand up and be heard on? On uh, religion, on uh, family values, on law and order, on legal processes, on integration, on job opportunities, on discrimination in trying to get jobs. There are so many issues that we could be speaking out on. Sorry. And then, how can Australian Sudanese capitalise on representation so that it actually improves things? Now, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that by having so many voices in the community, so many diverse groups and organisations, that maybe we are not able to achieve as much, but when we do speak out, when we do have something to say, and we're not able to follow through on the actions of speaking out to achieve better results. Now, I did a quick computer search over the last couple of days and I've handed out this um, double-sided piece of paper. Now, I did a search on Sudanese, the word Sudanese and the word Sudan in the Australian Bus Business Register, the um, Australian Securities and Investment Commission website, and a general Google search. I don't purport that this is a comprehensive list. I think the um, the organisation something like that is not on the list because the word Sudan was not actually in the name. But you will see from this list that there is a phenomenal number of organisations, and many of them appear to be duplication of the same thing. Now, the question would be, why? Why are there so many organisations? This list actually represents national and state-based organisations. I haven't put in all of those details. It was enough work getting this list together. You just have to bear with me. The point I'm making is the number of them, not a comprehensive analysis for you of what people are doing out there. So some of these organisations are justified on the basis of their geographical location. For example, the Liverpool Australian Sudanese Community Incorporated obviously is providing a service and process uh, networking capacity in Liverpool, in Sydney. The Fitzroy Sudanese Community Association is doing the same thing in Fitzroy. The uh, New South Wales Northern Rivers Sudanese Community Association is addressing the needs of the people who live in that area. And that is entirely appropriate. <coughs> then there are special interest groups. And so we have the, um, the new group that I was, well, the newish group, Sudanese Women on the Move Network. I went to one of their functions recently. Um, obviously that's an important group and women do need to have their own groups separate from the men's groups. We have the Sudanese senior citizens, the Sudanese tertiary students, Sudanese Media Watch, Sudanese, um, oh, what's another good one? There's so many good ones here. Um, Disability Action Group. These are all special interest groups that are entirely justified in their existence. But the question that I would put to you is, are there too many? Are there too many organisations out there that are taking up the resources of the few people who are able and willing to put in the effort to make things happen for the Sudanese community? And is there a lost opportunity by being fragmented into so many small groups that we actually are not able to achieve as much because our resources and our voices are too disparate, too diverse, too spread out, and therefore too faint. I would suggest to you that there are costs associated with having too many organisations. There are financial costs that are associated with incorporating an association. 
You have to pay to register an organisation. There's annual reporting requirements that need to be addressed. And in many cases, there's a business name registration needed as well. Now, I can go into all of those legal processes, and I did have a bit of a dilemma about how much to go into the actual legal processes that these um, that I'm talking about here, or whether to stay to the bigger theme. So if anybody has any questions on the actual legal processes, I can come back to it at the end of the talk. As I say, there are other costs getting good people involved. There is, I think, from uh, some statistics that I saw, around about 8,000 Sudanese people in Australia. That's not a huge pool to be drawing on in terms of getting people involved in the processes. The impact and the representation, and I think the consultation opportunities. There are government organisations and service organisations out there that are wanting to speak with you and to negotiate with you, find out what you want, find out how to give it to you, and they don't know who to deal with. They don't know which organisation they should be addressing. And there is also an issue that there are some grants that are available, like the Migrant Resource um, Centre, I think, gives out grants for special events. And the grants are getting smaller and smaller because there are so many different groups that are asking for the money. Okay, so what we need, I think, is to be looking at some sort of system or structure that will help to balance diversity and unity. I think that we also need to be looking at mechanisms that will improve conflict resolution so that there can be more effective representation. This is where I think, and maybe this is my bias as a lawyer, that it is important to understand the role of formal processes. There are benefits associated with incorporating your, your association rather than having just an informal network. But <coughs> there are rules and regulations that go with that whole thing. And you need to understand why the rules are in place. The rules of an incorporated association are basically saying that it isn't an individual who's running this show. If you want to be an individual and run your show, then set up a business and be a sole trader. But when you set up an organisation, an incorporated association, you are a collective group and you are accountable to all of the members of your group. And you are accountable to the people who give money to your group. And you have to have rules and processes that enable people to participate and to have involvement and to know how to be involved and to how to find out the accountability of the, the the organisation at any time, rather than seeing it as, I don't know what's going on, I don't understand where the money went, I'm walking away from it. The rules are there and they're very clear and they're very defined in the um, various acts. Of course, I'm based in Victoria, I'll be talking about Victorian acts, but there are similar acts in every state to deal with the incorporation of an association. And the rules are quite clear and quite specific, although written in, I guess, formal English language. So the rules are there to make sure that people can share in the processes, in the um, organisation, in the say of how resources are used. The rules are there to be accountable to each other and to the external providers and to empower people. When you have rules that say, this is how you become a member, this is how you become an office holder, this is how we spend our money, this is how we make sure our money is spent on the right things, this is what we're here for, this is our process, then people can see how they can come to be involved. And this enables us to bring new people in and to have a succession plan for our organisations so that when the powerhouse of your organisation right now, whether it's you or somebody else, when that person decides to step down, the whole organisation doesn't fall over. The rules enable us to empower people. Now, an association 
comprises of a constitution, which usually includes a statement of purposes, it includes members and it includes office bearers. In Victoria, the Associations Incorporation Act sets out a model constitution and <coughs> if you don't set up a constitution for your organisation, this is the uh, constitution that will apply, but you can make your constitution your own. And I would be saying to you that if you do take some time and some care, you can work out together as a group of people in your association what you want your association to do. And this comes back to the special needs kinds of associations or the geographical based organisations. But if we are all clear on what this organisation exists for and what its main purpose is, then we can all work together towards that purpose. You can make the constitution much clearer on how you work together. You do not have to pick up the model constitution rule and do what they say. If you want to have rules that say, we'll meet once a week in a coffee shop, then you can do that. The important point is to have rules that are clear and accessible to anybody who wants to be involved. They don't have to be formal, they don't have to be rigid, they don't have to be unreasonable, they just have to be rules on how you want to work together. So if you want to say that the decision making process is a show of hands, and if it looks like more hands than less hands, then it's passed, you can put that into your constitution. If you want a rule that says every decision must be voted on with a piece of paper, then you can put that into your constitution. You can be as formal or informal as you want it to be. You can also say that all our decisions will be informal, but if anybody's got a problem with it, then we will do this. And you go through the process of setting up how you want your organisation to work so that it will work for you. And I think importantly, we need to work out how to manage conflict within the association. My view is that the association is actually a place where we should welcome conflict. And I know that sounds really difficult. Um, conflict is an awful word. Conflict is an awful thing. But if we think of the conflict in terms of sharing ideas and um, allowing everybody to have some input and some involvement, we know that there will be disagreements. We know that there will be people who have a different view on how to get to that end goal, on how to achieve that purpose, on how to spend the money, on who to spend the money. All of those things are complex, but if we can work out how to manage conflict within the organisation, then with each conflict and its resolution, the association becomes stronger and more effective. How to work with other associations. How to see ourselves as part of a network that can achieve more when we go to somebody else and say we want to share resources or share information or learn from you or whatever it is. So what I would like you to think about is maybe taking that huge number of organisations, I don't know which ones are defunct, which ones are active, which ones are represented here today, and saying that we could have a structure where there are all of these types of organisations and they address special interests or they address geographical groupings, but they come together at a state level and then each of those states comes together at a national level. This is an idea that I would like you to think about. It is not an idea that we can resolve today, and I would not be asking anybody to resolve, resolve today. If it was going to be put as a resolution for today, then I would be saying vote against it, because you cannot rush into an organisational structure like this. It needs to be accountable, it needs to be fair, it needs to be thought about, and Quite frankly, I don't actually know what the legal solution is. I've got an idea of what the legal solution is, but this is not primarily my area of law that I work in, and I'm coming more as a 
motivated and concerned citizen than an expert telling you how to run your lives. Um, the idea of working towards something like this would mean that we could have groups that are women only groups or women only groups on special topics. We could have geographical groupings like Liverpool and Fitzroy and Darling Downs and everywhere else. And then we could have a forum where people can come together or representatives can come together, whichever is deemed the better process, at each state level. And then representatives can come together at a national level. And we can think about who will be speaking for the Sudanese in Australia. And you can see that there's a lot of scope there because we could say, who speaks for the Sudanese in Victoria? Who speaks for the Sudanese in New South Wales? Who speaks for the Sudanese in Australia overall? Who speaks for the Sudanese on issues about art and culture, or women's issues, or disability action, or whatever it might be? There's not one solution here to who should speak for the Sudanese. There are possible solutions, multiple multiple solutions, and I'd like you to think about that idea. In closing, I would like to come back to the idea of one way, one destiny. I would like you to keep and maintain the many ways that lead to the one way, but we need to identify what is the one way that we're looking for. And what is the one destiny that everybody wants to share? And how do we work together to get there? And how do we accept conflict as an opportunity to learn and grow? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, may I suggest that the point which was really shown to be uh, included in our uh, leader meeting, which we will be held this afternoon, as a brainstorm point. And from there, we can go and start uh, uh, you know, the discussions. Uh, thank you very much. Let's thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to invite the uh, Minister George. Lakis, the, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounced the name wrong. Sure, uh, I'm right. Sorry, Commissioner of Multiculture, thank you. I don't have to say sorry because I can't pronounce my name. I'm, I was born here, but I spell my name each time I say it to me to uh, hear my name. So I also keep uh, people send me letters uh, at home and at work, and I. Every time it's misspelled, I keep it, and I've got a big, a big, uh, big bag of misspells. It's amazing how many people can say my name in so many different ways. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. I've got it the past twelve. Okay. To the organisers of this uh, very important conference, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. To the community leaders that are here, ladies and gentlemen. May I begin by acknowledging, and of course, Amini Berrigan is one of our commissioners on the Multicultural Commission, and I welcome her here as well. May I begin by doing the right thing and acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are on. I pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, both past and present, and uh, it's very important that we acknowledge our traditional custodians of the land on which we, uh, which we are. We never used to do it when I was growing up. I never heard a public speaker or a politician refer to the fact that we acknowledge our Indigenous people. And it's really terrific over the last 10 years it's become standard to do so. On behalf of the Victorian Multicultural Commission, I am honoured to join you here today uh, to officially open this conference. We are gathered here today with the purpose of starting a serious dialogue about how the varied Sudanese community organisations in Australia could come together to create a federation, a council, or a representative body in their own making. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have a wide variety of many interesting and important speakers. It was very interesting to hear 
uh, the solicitor from the St. Law Centre talk about organisational structures. In Victoria alone, there's over three and a half thousand different organisations within our culturally diverse communities. Not, that's not in the Australian community generally. So there are varied ways in which people conduct their affairs uh, in the non-government sector. And it's an encouraging sign, especially for those with a diverse Australian Sudanese community who want to come together to move towards unity. One of the most important activities we can do as a society is to engage in dialogue and most importantly to listen to what other people have to say. And I'm sure you're aware, ladies and gentlemen, that Victoria is the most culturally and religiously and linguistically diverse state in Australia. And as chairperson of the Victoria Multicultural Commission, I am proud to say that I consider this diversity one of our greatest strengths and that our ability to experience, respect and appreciate each other's cultures is what ultimately makes us stronger as a community. This coming together of cultures here in Victoria, each listening and learning from one another, is one of the things that makes Victoria the vital yet harmonious place that it is. And it's been going on for the last 150 years. It commenced recently. This conversation amongst communities has been happening. And there's been some landmark developments, particularly in Victoria, where communities have come together to work together. For example, there before SDS was ever created, <coughs> communities came together to form their own radio stations, multicultural radio stations. Communities in Victoria came together and set up the first ethnic communities council in Australia. And that was because communities felt the need to cooperate with one another. And your discussion here today relates to that history. The Sudanese born community in Australia has grown rapidly in recent years, with almost all of the community arriving on our shores under the humanitarian migration program. As previous speakers have might have mentioned, our statistics indicate that there's about 6,000 Sudanese born persons in Victoria, with many settled in the municipalities of Greater Dandenong and Greenbank. Many Sudan born people arriving in Victoria and all across Australia have come here escaping horrific situations. Some may have endured unimaginable and traumatic experiences. Some may have fled here, escaping drought, famine, and of course, civil war. Obviously, it's important that these trauma are addressed during the settlement phase and support is extended to members of your community. But we must also realise that other challenges must be overcome as well during the settlement phase, when you may face new obstacles in your efforts to start afresh in a new and different country. Some of your community members may struggle with learning a new language, finding it difficult to know who to ask for help. They might struggle to fit in, always feeling that they are different or not welcome in their local community. And that's where, as a society and as governments, and as a community, must we must step in. You can tell much about a community by how it cares for the most vulnerable members of its society. And I, for one, believe that in Victoria, to be uh, honest with you, is a relatively inclusive and welcoming place, especially to those here coming here and seeking solace. There are many people in Victoria who have personally supported the Sudanese community and have done so in ways that's been unparalleled in the past, from my observation. You have many friends in government, you have many friends in the church sector. For example, in the recent uh, summit between religious leaders and the Premier, all the religious leaders, one after another, the head of the Catholic Church, head of the United Church, head of the Anglican Church here in Victoria, spoke about the Sudanese people and how much they want the government to assist. That's never happened before for a community. But that was on the tail of what was being said federally at the time. And it just surprised me the extent of support that your community has. And that's what's kept the, the positive work that's been done in our communities alive. That genuine sense of support for a community like yours. 
I believe it is the job of community groups, community leaders and government organisations to turn obstacles into challenges and problems into potential solutions. In May this year, the Victorian Government announced a $17.7 million strategy for the creation of a refugee support strategy focusing on health, education and justice issues. This is on top of various allocations that have been made over the last eight years to support community organisations directly and to target expenditure, particularly where there are specific problems and issues that community people face. This summer money and other money that's been put aside has a potential to do a lot of good for some of the most vulnerable members in our society. Some of you would have heard last week and were, are familiar with the recently launched Harnessing Diversity Report, a collaborative joint project between the Commission of my Commission and the Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission. It identified that unfortunately Discrimination is a significant issue for many community members from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, not just Sudanese, but a whole range of people. Importantly, the research has highlighted the systemic nature of employment discrimination, which can result in entrenched disadvantage and exclusion. However, the report does highlight a number of short-term and long-term interventions which can address this. I'm very proud to say to you today that along with the head of the Human Rights Commission and myself and the head of the Victorian Employment of Chamber of Commerce and Industry was a member of the Sudanese community who spoke at the launch of that report and how important it was for that person to convey specific incidents where discrimination was being faced and how it was being tackled. So along with raising those issues to the community at large, we also seek to address some of those barriers. Another important initiative that uh, the government has enacted upon here is increasing the supply of people that can communicate with people who cannot learn English. And we're proud to say that we've offered many scholarships to people who uh, assist members of the Sudanese communities in the various languages that are being spoken. So in a sense, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that I have come full circle. Our desire is to communicate, to engage in dialogue and to work together to face the challenges. And I believe this is the only way forward. It's important that we work together and that communities work together within communities to come forward with proposals for solutions to the difficulties that people encounter. What the aim of this conference here today is endeavouring to do is nothing new. All communities in Australia have endeavoured to bring about